mine too. There we go. I'm going to hang up the phone. Okay. <laughs> okay, bye. Okay, bye. Can I hear you? Can y'all hear me? Uh huh. Yeah, we can hear you, John. Can you hear us? Okay, good morning. Um, thanks for coming out early in the morning up there in cold Middlebury, Vermont. I still remember it well. Um, my claim to fame is that I was a basketball team teammate of uh, Chelsea's father. That's true. And, uh, <laughs> I was there from uh, 65 to 69. But we're here today to talk about California water and the uh, drought and the intersection of that with the development of, uh, of technology. Uh, I know this is a geography class and geography tends to rule a lot of other things. Just look at the uh, Middle East if you want. And uh, what we're going to do today is try to make a connection between um, California, the drought, groundwater, surface water, and uh, those sorts of things, which I've spent basically my entire life at doing water issues. I came down here to work for Senator Muskie of Maine on the environmental laws. Uh, in the 70s, we worked on the Solid Waste, the Clean Air Act, but most, most importantly, the Clean Water Act. And that brought into the intersection between clean water, water supply, groundwater, drinking water, water deliveries. And that's what I've been doing uh, for a long time. Uh, what I want to do quickly since time is of the essence, and we have a little technology problem, would you guys just introduce yourselves and tell me where you're from? I'm John Freshman. I'm from Washington, D.C. Why don't we start with the gentleman with the red hat, red hat just to get us going? Sure. And I'm, 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 Bill, I'm Bill Hagman. Uh, uh, I'm with Chelsea. I'm uh, teaching, teaching, co teaching the course here. I'm from uh, Huntington, Vermont. Oh, great. Yeah, Huntington Falls. Um, I want to talk a little bit about the uh, geography of California, uh, which is fascinating. If you if you look at it, it's got a straight line across the top, a straight line across the bottom. That's the borders with Oregon and Mexico, respectively. If you you know you had that that uh, thing, and then it's got a straight line down the uh, east side with a bow in the middle, right about Lake Tahoe, and the only natural boundary is the Colorado River, which is the lower part, which is the border with Arizona. It's got one major river system, which is entirely contained within the state. It's the San Joaquin flowing north and the Sacramento, which is a much bigger river system flowing south. They meet at the Delta, which is inland. It's a Delta. It's like the Mississippi Delta, except it's about 100 miles from the ocean. And it's got islands and wetlands and sloughs and grasses. And it's, uh, you know, the most uh, uh, charismatic uh, environmental area in California. People are always talking about protecting the Delta, keeping salt water from coming in the Delta. And the water gathers there, coming from the south, coming from the north, and then it it restricts itself again going through the Martinez Straits, and then it opens up again into the San Francisco Bay, of course, where they're restoring saltwater water wetlands in what used to be the uh, salt pond, and then it gathers into a narrow space again and goes out to the ocean. So if you look at the, a map of the world, you're really not going to see a system quite like that. There really are only two or maybe three, depending upon how you want to count it, small interstate waters. Um, on the north, there's the... Uh, Klamath and Trinity system, uh, there's the Truckee River, which uh, uh, straddles uh, California and Nevada, and there's some strange little body of water called the New River, which flows north out of Mexico into the Salton Sea. And the New River basically serves as a conduit for industrial uh, 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 waste from the uh, uh, electronic plants called the Magliadores, which are located just over the Mexican border. They're loaded with heavy metals, uh, just as an example, at a start. And that flows into the Salton Sea. Salton Sea is worth mentioning because it's a huge body of water which was created by the rupture of a canal that came from the Colorado River to the Imperial Valley, which is the southernmost agriculture area. And it ruptured. And it flowed unrestricted for five years into the lowest point on the landscape, which was the Salton Sea. And that's it. There's no inflow other than this tiny new river that I was talking about. 
and slowly but surely it's evaporating. It's becoming saltier, it's becoming less hospitable to fish and birds, and it's just evaporating. And there's about, you know, a million proposals to discuss how you're going to restore the Salton Sea. But people, they'll talk a lot about the fact that the Salton Sea isn't natural in the first place, and maybe it's just going to evaporate and not be there. That, of course, creates a problem of a lot of fugitive dust. In the middle of the state, you have the, you know, basically the, the length of Florida, the Central Valley, which is also amazing. It's ringed on the east by the Sierra. I know you guys have maps. I've just tried to quickly set the stage. And from the northernmost point on the Oregon water, which is Shasta and the Shasta Dam, uh, water flows down the Sacramento into the del Delta and is, uh, would otherwise flow out to the sea, but it's collected in these giant pumps of Tracy at the south, in the south end of the Delta. And parallel canals uh, run all the way down to Los Angeles and the southernmost part of the Central Valley. It's certainly the largest water conveyance a system in the world until China finishes the one that they're building from the Yangtze River uh, north to Beijing. So there's nothing like California, California water, California water conveyance. Groundwater, of course, is the easiest way to get water. You just put a straw in the ground and the water comes up, unless and until, of course, it is over allocated or overused. Most of the big basins uh, in the urban areas of California are uh, what we call adjudicated. So you are allocated a certain amount of water. If you're my neighbor and you start taking more groundwater, I take it to court, you get a cease and desist order. Those things are run by water masters. However, the Central Valley is not adjudicated. And the biggest, longest lasting, most catastrophic effect of the drought that started in 1910 and hopefully is being ameliorated by the El Nino right now is the overpumping of the south of the uh, of the Central Valley of California? People that have you know crops, particularly tree crops like almonds and pistachios and citrus. You know, if they lose a tree, it's 20 years to get it back. If you lose a field of uh, alfalfa, you lose one year's worth of crop. And so they're desperate and they're pumping the groundwater. And that, if you all saw the map of the article that Chelsea distributed to you. You can see where the really bright red is, that it's in the Central Valley. California is the only western state that does not have a, a statewide groundwater regulatory scheme. The adjudication I told you about, which happened in L.A. County, Riverside County, which enabled basically the cities to grow up, are, are local. They're, they're by basin. They're not, but the year before last, California passed a state groundwater law. And over a period of the next seven years, everybody's going to have to have a groundwater plan, and that's hitting the Central Valley right now. The thing about groundwater is it takes forever to create, and so it takes forever to restore. In the height of the, uh, of the groundwater uh, of a sort of travesty, which is really what it is, was when they can date this, and I'm sure it's, that's the technology side of things. The... Uh, uh, somebody was pumping groundwater in the Central Valley of California that was 800 years old. Funny that you can determine the age of water, but there's technology for you can. So it's going to take, left to you know natural devices, it's going to take 800 years to restore. Well, you're going to have to find ways to hasten that. And the first priority, uh, as the reservoirs start to fill, if El Nino holds, if we get a good snowpack and a good snowmelt, it's going to find ways to spread that water on the ground so that it can percolate back into the groundwater the same way that it did naturally, but with imported water, water from the Sierras. And I don't think the, either the techniques or the science or the technology is very far along because it's not happened a lot on a major scale in an agriculture region. Southern California, uh, including uh, something I'm very familiar with, we spread highly treated wastewater on the ground all the time in lots of places. It gets another level of treatment as it slowly percolates down into the groundwater and it comes out as well water and is essentially, you know, drinking water or household water supplies. But in the agriculture regions, they've never done that. And, and, and so what you're going to see is, is a lot of... Uh, 
including the geospatial stuff, our work go into how do we get this water into certain aquifers? Well, the first level of the aquifers is easy. That goes through the top level of soil. But then you're going to hit a layer of rock or a layer of impermeable, but there's groundwater below that. How did that groundwater get there? How did it get there? You know, how, why is it there in the first place? And how can you re recreate that, that pattern in a wet year, okay? How can you recreate that pattern so that you can replenish the deeper aquifer? We don't know, but that's one of the frontiers of technology. So that's a lot, and California water is a lot, and I'm hoping the drought is over. The most important thing, if the drought is over, that all the smart public policy people talk about, think about, work on, is that we don't unlearn the lessons of the drought. We've made gigantic strides in the urban area in water conservation. The statewide requirement is 27, is 25 percent, and very, very few people aren't meeting it. They're converting their lawns. They're recycling wastewater, viewing wastewater as a resource, recycled, highly treated wastewater. You know, it's drought proof. So you don't have to worry about getting it all the way down from Northern California. You don't have to worry about interruptions. It's water that you have that you're using over. And the stigma, the barrier is pretty much gone. We, you know, was derisively called 10 years ago when it began in San Diego, it was derisively called toilet to tap. You don't hear that anymore. You hear, you know, wastewater recycling. And you hear recycling for direct potable use. You hear it all the time. And what what needs to happen is that is that California um, needs to not go backwards, but to go forward. And one of the biggest frontiers is groundwater. I don't know if you can see it. I'm going to stop. But there's three pictures over my head. The one in the middle is Senator Robert T. Stafford from Vermont. Bob Stafford was from, he was senator to me, he was boss to me, he was from Rutland. He was a congressman and I went to work for him in 1970. And the two senators were George Aiken and Winston Prouty. And Winston Prouty had just been reelected to a six year term, of course, to the Senate. He died six months into his term and Stafford was appointed to the five and a half year unexpired term. And we all came over to the Senate with him which was fun, and that's where I got involved with Senator Muskie. Later on, Bob Stafford was actually chairman of the Environment Committee and made major contributions to our national environmental law, as well as our emergency relief laws, as well as our, as our student aid. He, was, uh, he didn't die that long ago. He lived to be 95. He was a great man uh, from Vermont. So what I'd like to do is start a conversation. I hope I've given enough uh, pillars to work that conversation around. Uh, Chelsea, you can help guide us, but mostly I want us all to participate and and take this to the next level and use the rest of our time in an interactive mode. Um, and so that's what I told Chelsea we were going to do, and that's what I want to do. If there's anything in particular that I should spend a few minutes talking in more depth about, I'm, uh, of course, more than happy to do that. Well, I'm actually hoping, John, I'm going to ask one question before um, before we open it up to the floor here, but I'm wondering if you can tell us a little bit more about um, pol actual policy making and so and sort of what does it take, for instance, you know, the governor of California, we've talked a little bit about Prop 218, we've talked about the executive order um, that he issued in 2015. What does it take behind the scenes to make a, a new policy like that come together? Uh, at the state level? Sure, at the state level. Or at the federal level or Which, both? Whichever, whichever, or both, yeah, whatever floats your boat. Well, it, cra it creates a great uh, juxtaposition, so why don't we do both? Uh, you know, Brown is in his second go-round, in the second term, in his second go-round, and he has a, uh, uh, actually a veto-proof majority of the House and the Senate, so he can pretty much... Um, not nobody can do what they want in a democracy and a republic, which is what we are. Thank God, but he has a lot of influence over policy. And is, is Prop Two Eighteen the water bond? Is that what you're talking about? Yeah, Prop Two Eighteen. I can't remember by, by number. Yeah, we. Yeah, I couldn't remember by the number. It's the seven billion dollar water bond, which includes storage and recycling and and uh, and conservation, and it's the first statewide initiative that has significant money for recycling, also groundwater storage. 
that was passed by the voters. That's an initiative. It was at about twelve billion dollars. Uh, it had passed the uh, state house and the state senate. I think it was twelve or thirteen billion dollars. Uh, Brown sent it back to the legislature and said, "I'll sign seven billion." And basically, the next week it was done. That doesn't happen back here, unfortunately. But that's the way that happened out there. The uh, the groundwater law was a long time in coming, and um, it was the drought, pure and simple, and the overpumping in the Central Valley that gave that the legs um, that it needed to get through. It's purely a regulatory program, where the other, of course, is a funding program. In stark contrast to that is the lack of any meaningful uh, involvement in either funding or regulatory activity uh, by the federal government. It's been, with the exception of occasional bottled water and emergency water supplies, it's been, the federal government has been almost invisible in the California drought. And in the land of personal opinion, I think it's a real shortcoming and a kind of a, tra a tragedy. But uh, there's no, um, uh, there's no funding available for recycling. Everything is frozen. You can't get a new project starting. That's not true that there's no funding. There's inadequate funding. And that's because there's a, uh, with respect to surface water, there's a giant substantive disagreement. It expresses itself politically, but it's grounded substantively, and people just kind of focus on the politics, but that's not what it's about. And that's worth telling you about for a minute. In 1992, uh, Congress passed the Central Valley Project Improvement Act, and it guaranteed 800 million acre feet. Water's always expressed in acre feet, which nobody, I think, in part is because nobody understands what that is. But I've got a table here we can do it in terms of gallon. Uh, 800 acre feet had to flow from the San Joaquin, which is a much smaller river system, and from the Sacramento, and make it to the Delta to provide a sufficient flow for anadromous fish, salmon in this case, although steelhead come into the picture, and it's really the winter run Chinook salmon. Well, when the drought hit, the federal government, which controls both anadromous fish through the National Marine Fisheries Service in the Department of Commerce, and pelagic fish, which is freshwater fish, through the Fish and Wildlife, in the Interior Department, they don't talk to each other. I don't think they've ever met each other. And they, uh, they, they, they have upheld the decision that this flow has to be maintained. Well, when the drought started and surface water deliveries to the Central Valley were curtailed respectively by the state, which operates a state water project, and the feds, which operates the Central Valley project, agriculture was, uh, uh, given 0% of their entitlement, maybe 10%. They just got up to 10% now with the new cell phone. But the fish water was mandated, and propitiously, for the first time in 20 years, in the middle of the drought, the winter-run Chinook salmon showed up at the San Joaquin River in mass. And all of a sudden, you had to continue those flows to allow them to spawn and to allow them to get have enough volume to allow them to get back down the river and out to the ocean. And and that is the heart of the conflict because those those the anatomous fishes, of course the salmon, I've said that, the, the uh, I'll think about the black fish is the delta smelt, and those fish are both endangered species governed by separate respective biological opinions. So that water has to be delivered or you're violating the Endangered Species Act. The House of Representatives Republicans, where they have a major majority, want to change the Endangered Species Act so that that, we call it environmental water, that 800 million acre feet can be freed up for deliveries of, of, of uh, irrigation to the Central Valley. So the answer is policy making in Washington is dead stalled because California can't agree, despite some heroic efforts by members on both sides to do it. You're not allowed to spend any new money without an offset, so you don't have projects like you do in the $7 billion bond bill. And the Endangered Species Act, uh, for a good reason by and large, is a sacred cow not to be touched. It's certainly the holy grail of the, uh, sorry to mix my metaphors, 
sacred cows and holy grail. <laughs> you know, I don't know quite. You know, they just kind of come out. Uh, but the the, the uh, you know you can't touch. Uh, now I'm going to ask you another one. It's the third rail of environmental politics. So now you've got three things. Okay, we got the the, the, the holy trinity of uh, of why you can't touch endangered species. Act. And it's just it, it's absolute. You know, lockdown. So you've got you've got California, which has acted up the other. I can't remember if you mentioned this, Chelsea, but with respect to the mandatory 25 percent cut, the passage of the state water bond and the statewide groundwater authority, those are three major things. And the whole time those three things have happened, the federal government has done absolutely nothing. And that shows you so many contrasts and so many ways you're interested in exploring, Chelsea. And group about policy making and how it's done and how it's not done. Questions? Yeah, I think topics. If you want me to go off at a, you know, if there's a particular area you want me to hear more about, it doesn't have to be a question, but help me figure out how to flow this conversation. What do you guys got? Go ahead, just be loud. There is a suggestion that like California is always going to be dry and it'll go in like waves and peaks of being in drought. Do you think there needs to be a bigger cultural overhaul in California to kind of plan for the future? Did you hear that? Oh, that, that's a great question. Yeah, I did hear it and I love the question. And um, the answer is yes. Uh, California, Southern California is a desert. We all know that. And there are 20 million people uh, the, 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 the line between uh, Northern California and Southern California is the Tehachapi Mountains. And below the Tehachapi is all the way to the San Diego border. You probably have 20, 22 million people living in a desert. I mean, it is a desert. If you spend any time out there, I hope you get to. It's got small coastal streams. It's got one river all the way at the end of it, which is a Colorado, which is, we can talk about, by the way, is incredibly overdrafted, overdrawn, oversubscribed is the word I wanted. And they, they, the reason they're there is because of water imported from the Colorado River and from the Sacramento River all the way at the northern end of the state. It comes all the way down from the Sacramento River River. <laughs> you know, did you see enough of that? Yep. <laughs> Come all the way down to the dam right here. To Los Angeles right here. And it flows in the river, but it's allocated, it's it's owned, even though it's in the river. That's another amazing thing about California water. And then it flows through the dry areas in these giant canals that are as big as the not as big as as big as big as Otter Creek. And, and they're concrete line channels, but it's ending. I mean, people have got religion. Uh, they're, they're, Southern California uh, does not want to be dependent on water from faraway sources. The water is oversubscribed, especially in the Colorado, but also in the Sacramento. And the 25% produced sort of a wonderful competition among cities and towns. I did better than you did. I did 27%. And it's been, in the drought in Southern California, really there are certain segments of society that always have hardships so but but basically it has not been a major problem or a major hard hardship for for the developed communities it's it's really interesting they've been able to get enough water from uh uh existing storage there's a giant lake out in a man-made lake out in the desert east of los angeles that you've never heard of it's 25,000 acres it's 200 feet deep and it's full and it's in the desert, and it's all uh, Northern California water and Colorado River water. And by reusing groundwater, recycling, reclaiming, uh, it, it, the culture is changing. Uh, oddly enough, the more quote unquote liberal, progressive Northern California is way behind on recycling. It's the opposite of what a casual uh, glimpse would suggest. And I'm fascinated by that. I kind of love it when the Northern Californians howl about they're stealing our water. Meanwhile, they don't do any water recycling up north. They don't do any groundwater storage to speak of. It's kind of a funny, you know, how you know, strange bedfellows. So, yes, the answer is yes. You're going to see a major cultural change that's going to endure 
in, in Southern California. Northern California is different because you got to remember that California is, is not only the eighth largest economy in the world, but it's also by far, by far the largest agriculture producer in America and must be larger than almost any other country. I can't, I don't know how to say that, so I'm not going to say it. But and, and things you wouldn't think of, rice, the largest rice producer in the country, that's all north of Sacramento, that's all um, Sacramento River water. It's the largest dairy by far in the country, the largest cheese, I mean, and you just name it, you know, wheat. Uh, and then, of course, you know, strawberries, raspberries in Monterey, all those raspberries, any raspberries you buy in the supermarket come from Monterey, California, which is off the central side in the Central Valley. And so, you know, it, 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 it dominates the culture and the economy uh, in ways that people don't recognize. It's very profitable, and that's why. So the change there is different uh, with respect to your question than the change in northern and southern California, but it's going to change. This drought will change things forever. Let's think of a question we can ask and answer if they don't have one. <laughs> we, got, we got one, John. Uh, are there any approaches to reduce agriculture in California so we don't consume all the water? Are there any what? What was the first part? Are there any pushes to reduce agriculture in California? So to actually uh, reduce the agricultural good. industry or reduce the water usage? Both, or both. Yes. Reduce the industry. In order to reduce the the use of water, but also both, I guess. Those are great. Yeah, and, and you separated them. Uh, the last guy, you separated them exactly right. Uh, drip irrigation, um, uh, covering. Uh, it's really cool. You can actually, if you cover the root system that's closest to the surface with a tarp, leave a little opening. Let's just say for a. Uh, 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 the you, you surround the whole root system and so you prevent evaporation of the water that you're dripping into the system and you only drip that into the whole hole. That's one thing. In some cases you cover the entire, entire crop. Evaporation is of course the biggest user. I mean the, 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 the crops suck up a lot but a lot of it is just lost into the air. In, in Israel all of the agriculture where I've seen uh, demonstrations of it are, are operated basically under cover. So drip irrigation, timing irrigation, so you irrigate at night, so you reduce the evaporation. There's some really progressive uh, farmers and farm companies in, in California that are doing all of those things. Reducing agriculture, I think the drought uh, probably weeded out a lot of the marginal producers. We call it the, the west side, obviously, you can just... The, the west side of the valley is more alfalfa, which is basically, you know, fodder. And they grow alfalfa. I mean, the, the, the example that the people that don't like agriculture say is they're growing alfalfa for, um, uh, to feed cows in China. Well, I'm not sure that that's exactly right, but they're, they're low-value crops as opposed to almonds, which are incredibly high-value but also use a lot of water or citrus, which is high value, which uses a lot of water. I don't expect a big contraction. You know, agriculture in California is big business. You know, they're well run, they're well funded. Um, lettuce is by far the large lettuce producer in the world. That's down way down south and in Monterey. So I expect more and more conservation, more, less and less dependence on imported water, but I don't see a contraction in the size of the industry. Do you, to kind of tag on to that, John, do you see any, um, there's been a lot of talk about agricultural water regulation kind of lagging behind residential water use, and I'm wondering, you know, what, what, do, you, what do you think about that? Is residential water use ahead in terms of, from the regulatory perspective, are there more policies and, and why? Yeah, yes, yeah, way ahead, way ahead, and that's because it's delivered by organized uh, water districts. You know, it's rate-based, although there's an inch, um, a really interesting irony there that I'll come back around to. It's rate-based. Um, 
it's measured and and uh, when I spoke to uh, the CEO of Chelsea's company, he talked about the fact that they can really do a good job of house by house measuring what goes in and what comes out. That's harder to do uh, with a large agriculture tract. So, and, and it's, it, it, you know, they have permits for their discharges if they're a wastewater treatment plant. Irrigation return flows, the irrigation that comes back off the field after you've irrigated and then it flows back into a channel, those are exempt from the Federal Clean Water Act. So it's much, much more highly regulated and much uh, farther along. And I think the next step is the groundwater replenishment that I talked about and more conservation by agriculture users, either by regulation or because it's frankly well, it makes the crop more profitable because water uh, is is um, is getting it, it, the price has gone way up during the drought. Yeah. Uh, yeah. The other irony is though that if you're if you're the you know a water district in in Orange County and you reduce your usage by twenty five percent, that means the households are going down by twenty five percent. That means their meters are going down by twenty five percent. That means their bills are going down by twenty five percent. But your fixed car cost is in the treatment and the distribution, if not in the water itself. So if you're suffering a 25% reduction to operate your uh, your water distribution company, and you don't know how to make up that money. And it's 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 a major, it's a significant economic dislocation. So you see what I'm saying? Due to the drought, you don't get as you, you don't get as much in in billing. We just actually talked a little the bit reduction, about. Sorry. Yeah, no, we talked a little bit about that today, actually, and we just started to take a very quick look at budget-based rates and what it means because obviously from a geospatial perspective the GIS experts are the ones that can provide a budget a water budget or an allocation so we started to talk a little bit about budget-based rates as a potential solution for that conservation revenue stability um, question right there's another one too which is in the San Gabriel River or probably the Santa Ana River, which you work on too, much of the flow is highly treated wastewater. Uh, that's highly treated. I mean, way beyond secondary treatment. And we can talk about what those distinctions are, by the way, if you'd like to. And so when the less water comes into the houses, less comes out in the form of a sewage, less goes to the treatment plant, well, also, less goes to the river. And you are required by the Endangered Species Act to return a certain amount of flow to the river because the species has grown up. It's probably dependent, probably grew up dependent on the recycled wastewater. But you're not allowed to take it away, even if it's even if it was not there indigenously. You're not allowed to take it away, and so that's another ironic uh, regulatory conflict. Yeah, look at the marker. Yeah, are there are there any special interest groups uh, lobbying at either like the state or federal level that is slowing down the process of creating agricultural uh, regulation for water use? Yeah. I'm gonna let Anik do. I'm gonna let Anik do that. She used to work on the House uh, for the chairman of the on agriculture issues in the House of Representatives. Uh, actually, on agriculture, there was a law that was passed in 2011. It was the Food Safety Modernization Act that requires all agriculture uh, farms to test their water sources. Uh, however, you want to talk about regulatory burdens. That law has yet to be implemented. FDA has released. Food and Drug Administration. Yeah, Food and Drug Administration released in November of last year their final proposed rule, and they will come into effect for another couple of years. So. It's not necessarily that there's special interest, which there is on both sides, because farmers don't want to pay more money to produce the crop, which eventually they'll pass on to you as a consumer. But it's that the FDA has yet never hasn't done any overhaul of their safety rules since you should the nineties or the nineties, yeah. Um, so it's just a huge regulatory overhaul that they have yet to finalize. Uh, you'll see the new rules come into effect in the next year or so. Um, again, that's the Food Safety Modernization Act, and that was passed in 2011. So you can see how long it's been. And with respect to the special interest, uh, California agriculture is highly consolidated. 
and it's highly profitable, and they are very, very active politically, and a lot of them are resistant to any change. So the answer to your question is there there are a lot and they give a lot of money to uh, to candidates to basically stop any change. Uh, these are you know the, the Central Valley uh, agriculture was it was started by migrants from uh, Oklahoma uh, from the Dust Bowl of the basically 1910, 1912, 1914, and they came out you know with all of their belongings and their spare tires and everything else loaded on the truck. These guys, the, the original ones that bought the land, they're multi, multi millionaires. They're organized and they're out to protect, like any other organized economic sector of society, they're out to protect what they have. And they are a lot of money flows. So the answer to your question is yes. So I guess my question is like, what are um, like politicians and like policymakers doing right now, like other than? fundraising like what are they doing what's the everyday conversation because as as i understand i think we had a reading that's like um agriculture in california makes up only two percent of the gdp but we're uses like 70 percent of the water or something like that yeah. 80 80 percent of the water yeah which is like pretty ridiculous right. like that that disparity so so what are policymakers like doing in the everyday in the face of that disparity, like what's what's happening right now? Uh, well, the, the 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 most authentic and truthful way is they're fighting in D.C. as opposed to California. I mean, and that was that 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 you added the other uh, dimension of the three-dimensional thing. The dimension that I talked about was the Endangered Species Act. Uh, the, the agriculture wants more water diverted and delivered uh, from the uh, big water projects, and though in, you know, the environmentalists, and in this case, you know, Democrats and agriculture, in this case, Republicans, uh, are are just cannot get past it. In three years, they've been trying to come up with some sort of a compromise. Senator Senator Feinstein is heroic, and she pushes something forward every year. At, at the moment, it's a bridge too far, and they've been unable to reach agreement. And the rest of the Western states uh, get it, and they say, "Well, geez, you know, Cal and this is D.C. now. Remember, mm -hmm. California can't get it together. Why should we do anything for them?" So nothing significant has happened uh, with respect to these issues in three or four years, and I don't expect anything to happen this year. Maybe next year, and it'll be in the form of more of a of a Western approach rather than a California approach, because California is unable. To reach agreement within itself, uh, back here. Yeah. Are other states getting involved in uh, water rights related to California? You mentioned the Colorado River. Oh yeah. Uh, water. Yeah, the Colorado River is. Uh, I just got. Settled again. There's a lower basin and the upper basin, and the lower basin compact was just uh, within the last year or two. You know, was continued. It's a it's a long term agreement, and that's been, of course, uh, uh, Nevada, New Mexico, Arizona, California, and uh, it's it's an iterative process because a lot of people. It's the drinking water for Las Vegas. It's, uh, it, it's uh, California has the biggest entitlement. What water district in California, which is at the very bottom of the state, has a larger entitlement than most of the other states? The water district has 6,000 people, the Imperial Valley. 6,000 people, and they have a bigger, as big an entitlement as Nevada. Think about it. Yeah, so when we looked at maps and we talked about <coughs> metropolitan water and how they distribute water to all of Southern California, and we looked at the Palo Verde Valley, it was way over on the area. Yeah, yeah. You guys looked at the Palo Verde Valley. And then we also looked right at the Mexican border with that that crop area, the agricultural area. That's the Imperial Irrigation District. Yeah. And so, they, they own right. significant water rights to um, the water coming from the Colorado. Right. And, and hopefully this will change, but, but Hoover Dam, uh, which is the major, but by far, by far not the only 
has gotten so low that it's below the that 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 Las Vegas had to had to relocate their intakes and move them down to a lower place uh, in the dam so that they could continue to get their water. And those things are going to take forever. Uh, and then Glen Canyon Dam above that is both silting up and low. And then uh, the the uh, uh, you go down farther. There's Parker Dam is where Southern California gets its water. And, and so it, it's constantly being litigated. Colorado is very has huge issues uh, with respect to the Continental Divide and moving water across. Uh, Colorado water is to, it's on a smaller scale. It's every bit as interesting as California. And if you have an appetite for another state, that's where I would direct you because. Uh, the western slope, of course, drains to the Colorado, and the eastern slope uh, is, is not very well watered. The Platte River is small. This is not a this is not an incorrect pronunciation, guys. The Arkansas River is small, and they don't have much water in them all. So Colorado gets its water with a tunnel underneath the Rockies, and that is always a source of uh, of conflict and both. On environmental issues, but water rights issues. What, what uh, well, that? the 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 and Arkansas flow into the Mississippi watershed, but at that part of it, there's not much water. It's just there, those are eastern Colorado is basically uh, uh, arid. So I'm, I'm actually wondering, um, and I don't know if this is something that you haven't worked on, then forget it, but we, we talked a little bit this morning about the San Juan Capistrano case and about the litigation there and sort of what the impact of that, of that uh, results of that case were, and specifically because we've been talking a little bit about conservation, and, and I'm wondering if you could elaborate on that a little bit. No, I don't really. Uh, can you give me the gist of what it's about? I might drop my memory, or I can see if I can grab it on Google real quick. I might know, but I don't. I don't recognize it by that name. I know where San Juan Capistrano is, obviously, or where the swallows return. Yeah, it was just the case where they, uh, the courts ruled that their tiered rate structure was unconstitutional because they, oh. hadn't, they hadn't properly, they hadn't properly associated rate costs to. Uh, to uh, extensive users. I can't do it. I don't know. <laughs> That's right. I'd rather not. I'd rather not bluff it. <laughs> what other questions do you have? Although you're going to see a lot of readjustment of rates because of the price. You know, the biggest desal plant in the country, if not the world, just opened up about a month ago. Uh, actually, it's on the other side of the marine base from San Juan Capistrano in uh, Oceanside. And that water is $1,200 an acre foot, which is by far the most expensive water in the country and close to the most expensive water in the world. And um, you're going to see implications of that uh, throughout uh, Metropolitan, which is this giant $17 million water wholesaler. They set their, they set their standard rate at 450 so this is three times that, and that's just going to cascade throughout the system. And probably the price structure is going to have as much impact on the other gentleman's question about reforming water deliveries in agriculture, because their water is all subsidized. I mean, that the historic water deliveries to the Central Valley are, you know, less than $100 an acre foot or less than one twelfth what the desalinated water is. Yeah. So an acre foot is 43,560 cubic feet, 225,851 gallons. And why they measure it in acre feet instead of meters or something like that is just, you know, why do we not use meters? You know, why do we? It's, it's pretty fun. We still use feet and yards and acre feet. Uh, John, this is Bill Hegman. Uh, just a quick well, see if see if you can uh, this work. This course is you know focused a lot on on these geospatial technologies and, that are emerging and uh, how they're being used. Uh, can you speak at all to some of 
GIS, geospatial technologies, and how they might sort of, I guess, influence policy decisions. Do you have any thoughts on that? Uh, how can we use these to, to change or change the way people look at policy or, 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 or issues? And I can give you an example, John, that might help, but so the kind of analysis that my company does where we can determine water efficiency for every, a water budget essentially for every city in the state, we can bring that information to the State Water Resources Control Board and they can think about uh, actually changing the conservation targets so that they're efficiency based rather than usage based. That's, that's an example. Yeah. I don't know if you have any, any experience with it, but I just wondered if, if you did and, and you saw any Anything that was really places, useful. Places we could Everything use I know about that I learned from uh, Chelsea and uh, her CEO with whom I met. Sorry, that's not my... Okay. But, but, but the, intersect, the inter intersection of science and policy and politics is something I know a lot about. Uh -huh. And like with respect to the Endangered Species Act and, and how science drives those decisions and, and, and at what point can science influence politics and at what point does politics simply not care and you know it really really comes to the fore in in, uh, in global warming uh climate change whatever you would like to call it carbon reduction and and there you see a large body of people that that are are actively hostile to science um in 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 water our ability to measure uh contaminants has outstripped our ability to regulate them. And so we can find that, you know, parts per billion, but like, what does that mean? Uh, and so for, for the geospatial stuff to actually take hold, it's gonna have to come to the policy arena and then to the, that's the continuum, science to policy to politics. It's gonna have to come from the ground up and just slowly change the way people think about these things. Time for one or two more. It'll, it'll happen. Yeah. Uh, you had mentioned earlier that you're pulling up groundwater, uh, that like you're pulling up from aquifers, like the like, water like in the Yeah. Um, so even though like you might have a better year with El Nino storms, are there any efforts to ensure that you're replenishing this water in the long run past the end of the drought? It's just starting uh, in the agriculture areas and that's the place where I think technology is really uh, hopefully going to be helpful, which is how do you retrace the pathway that got it there originally? In other words, where, where do you go to put it back so that, it'll, so that underneath the ground it'll follow the same migratory path that it followed in the first place to get there? And then how do you speed that process up? Because I was talking about 800-year-old water. Well, you really want to replenish that as soon as you can. How do you speed it up? And, and, and the lower, you know, all aquifers, you know, rarely, you know, like maybe in the Ogallala, you might have a big underground pool. But aquifers are not underground pools, as you can see from uh, fracking. I mean, they're dispersed among the rock layers. They're, they're dispersed among the sand layers. Uh, you, when you drill it, you create underground pools so that they'll collect before you can, before you can pump it out. And so you have to recreate that path. And there's some scientists in Fresno, and there's been some stuff you could Google it in the press recently about spreading grounds that they're developing to uh, to recharge the uh, groundwater in the Central Valley. And, and I only saw it within the last month, and it's the first I've ever seen of it. I have one question to kind of close things out. Um, sure. Is there a single issue? Well. This may be kind of general, but is if if you could pass one regulation today that you think would have the greatest impact in California, what do you think the single most important policy that we could pass would be? Uh, 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 it doesn't work. There isn't. <laughs> uh, I don't. I don't ever duck questions. I'll answer a question. And the answer to your question is there isn't one. Uh, Just you know, too, too California much. is way ahead of the nation and way ahead of everybody else in the world except for Israel, except for the Central Valley. And the federal government does not have jurisdiction over groundwater, and the main issue is groundwater. So you really got to get done uh, by the state and by the farmers 
And there are, there are plenty of progressive farmers out there, too, along with the guys. You know, a lot of people just want to close their eyes. The drought's over. Let's go back to cheap water the way it was. And that's particularly true in the agriculture community, much more true than it is in the residential community. And they have to get religion. And I don't think you can legislate that. So I will give you one answer. The federal government needs to be more involved, and we need to view it as an infrastructure issue, and we need to match local and state funding, and we need to get more money into the system through a number of uh, things that are in Senator Feinstein's most recent bill. So there's a straight answer. I like it. Anybody else? Nope. Well, I think we're just about wrapping up time on our end, John. So um, thank, Good. You, thank you so much for joining us. This is excellent. Good. Well, thanks for having me. And if you have follow-up questions, you know, Chelsea knows where to find me. And, and uh, we'd be happy to uh, answer them or continue the process. Excellent. All right. Thank you, John. Thanks thank for you, taking John. the time. Yes. We appreciate it. You're welcome. It's my pleasure. All right. Take care. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye. Okay. Okay. So you get some sense. You probably had it before.